year, uh, um, 16,000 leaders, and the big ones here, 20,000 leaders, and we're hoping to knock over 1.5 million leaders this year. The smaller ones down here, there are 8,000, and they're going to continue to use for our contract rules, because of the use of beer, there's a lot of people who run brewers and supporting it for beer, but uh, brewery by brewery, and uh, by brewery, uh, brewery. So here we have the beginning of it all really. Um, this is where the malt comes in. There's the malt there. This is probably uh, Gladfield's malt. Um, it's a good, good boutique New Zealand malt. It's got lots of different types of uh, varieties we can use. In former times the malt is only we as well on and DB only made like three colours of lager, that would be quite a variety of malt as we as craft brewers do. Um, so we get a lot of Gladfield's malt we use. German wheat malt for, for wheat beers, you can't make every beer out of grain from one place. So, what do you do? The brewer gets his malt built, and that's just basically a list of all the types of malt he needs for that particular type of beer. So, you may have four of those, four of those, four of the other one, three of the other, and it all goes to the auger. And the auger will wind it up to the mill at the top there. We all know the old saying is they pour grist to the mill, it'll get ground up to a grist. The hopper, and it'll come over to this one here. That was our mash tun, but we've now moved up to this one here, which is the mash louter tun. It does um, both the mash and the loutering. Now, the mashing is a, is a um, mash here, it takes about an hour and a half. It's sparse over with hot water. It's basically cooked and stirred for an hour and a half, and that's the final conversion of the enzymes given there, converting those stored carbohydrates into fermentable and unfermentable sugars. Now you've got to get a bit of a balance there because if you have no ferment unfermentable sugars, sure your beer will be strong because it's the fermentable sugars that give us the CO2 and the alcohol, it's the unfermentables that give you your mouth weight. So if you don't have any mouth weight in your beer, it's very thin and watery. So if you, that's one of the reasons why lemonades are always full of sugar because of the glycerol effect of the sugar gives you, gives you a mouth weight. So smashed. Mashed in, stirred, cooked, the conversion of the carbohydrates by the enzymes over to the fermentable sugars, and then we'll louter it. Now, loutering is a bit like coffee bainer. You can rotate it through a couple of times to get a bit more of an extraction, and then we'll pump it through to the kettle. Now, if we, in, the, in former times, in the Middle Ages, and that when the, when the surface water was undrinkable in the cities, what they do, they do the first runnings, the first extraction, and they go through for the first beer. What was left, what we normally do, we give it to the farmer, but what they would do, they would make another brew out of it to make a small beer, which is about one and a half, two percent, and that's what you give you. You drink morning more than food and tea in the old days because it's the safest thing to drink because there's no sewage reticulation and the water had to be boiled so it was safe to, safe to drink. You manage what, imagine what the water would be like in Antwerp after they come all the way down through Europe, not to Antwerp, it's like everything's been thrown in all the way down, so London pretty much the same as well. So we extract it out, we end up with our wort, which is the colour of our beer, it's hot, it's sweet because of what we extracted out of the malt, and they go through to the kettle, which is over here. Done at the same temperature at the same time, the 
same order each and every time, otherwise the deal will come out different. So they can't go away and have a cup of tea, oh well, I should be doing this when you want to put back with them. Can't do that because of the difference of that. Our brewers are there timing it and then with the hops, and that is boiling away. All the fun is like your, your bittering hops are in first and your aromatic hops go in last and you want to pour off the aromatics. So the hops are introduced in the kettle. Now with our pale ales, we actually dry hop them in the, in the, in the fermentation vessel and that way this grips up the hop characteristics a bit more in the beer. So boiled hops are in through the heat exchanger because you have to cool it down to a temperature you can put your yeast into, otherwise I'll make it bread kills off the yeast. In the, uh, the, the, the pure Australian yeast known as the bird from brewing industry, it's also the bird from the baking industry, you need to brew it, the bake and it's just use brewer's yeast instead of making sourdough all the time. So these are our fermenters. Movement, and that's where you end up with New Zealand brewers 
and the minion brewers. Now straight away after the war, because of the corporate guys were getting together, they lagerized all the styles. And by 71 they wanted to get us down to like three styles, three colours of lager. Now this the craft beer thing in essence really is a, a reaction to this blending out of food and drink part of the war. And, you know, partly due to rationing. So you start in the for the eighties you start getting proper People start drinking proper coffee, start getting a wider variety of cheeses, there's some pedos here with dairy. Go get some cheese, so go to get some cheese, they get cheese, get cheddar. Get white bread, you can break it in half or sort of tank like. You're lucky they have brown bread. Now you look at all those things, and there's a complete variety. People are more interested in what they're eating and drinking. They might have a better, one of them is traditional, they might have a better relationship with it. So that's one of the things that sort of push the craft you think a lot. So we're in here, we get the kind of lager about a month. I was about three weeks. We can leave it on there. We can take off the uh, truck at the bottom because so we leave it on there, we can probably flavour. But we'll either take it out there for the tax and fruit and the bright beer room and stop us uh, off the school. Sweetness to it, and generally you want to have your beer slightly sweeter than the food, and then you 
here on the class of this pricker characteristics of the beer. Once the condition is in there, we one, one micron filter, which means our beer is actually still alive, product that still lasts in live yeast in our beers, and we can put nine months on it, which is great. Apart from, of course, the Belgian, the Belgian ales, which we're thinking about putting a best after date on, so it takes about nine months for them to really get their straps and, and a bottle. So one micron filtered off to the kegs or to bottling plant, which is bottling plant is made in China, but you know they do certain things to make the German market and the Japanese markets uh, very well on the control of China. Um, starts off in there, it'll pick up the bottles, bring them through, it'll sterilize them, wash them and clean them, and then it'll keep wet the inside, and then it'll create a vacuum inside the bottle, and then the beer will go in, and then another will vacuum, and then CO2, and that way you can keep the open oxygen off your beer as much as possible. This thing's got 32 heads and it will really crank them out. We never really have to get it up to full speed. It actually do almost 20,000 litre tanks in about six or seven hours at half speed if you want it. Comes along and through here, goes down there, gets a light, light, light pasteurisation, not really, you know, just to clean it up a bit. Along here, through the bottling plant, and then there's a gang of all the lumpers at the end, filling up the boxes. And that's the only sort of manual part of it now. Our original bottling plant was when we bought a part of cider, we bought off a, a lemonade company from back in the days, we won Lord's Pound had its own lemonade company. And luckily for us, Carl is also a, um, an engineer, so this is what I can describe as his Meccano set, he's been able to sort of fix everything and put everything together. So we're very lucky that way because you know, he, he can do the thing and it's probably save us millions and years these over the years. And this is where we are today, um, we have more tanks coming. And we have had to um, hire the back of the next tech factories along this. We're still growing quite rapidly like, like the rest of the craft beer industry. So probably 30% of our product will go out in bottle, 70% will go out, sorry, 30% goes out in keg, 70% will go out in the bottle, and of that 70% will go to the supermarkets, and that's pretty much where we go. Um, the biggest export markets are uh, Japan, sorry, the biggest export market are Ireland and Canada. Most consistent one, of course, is our cousins across the border of Australia. So that's pretty much it. Should we go through and try a little sample of what we've got?